Thank you for that wonderful sort of sense of the scope of his work and what he was doing. Um, I'm looking at it much more from a contemporary point of view as to what is happening with design practice and the role of design as an integral part of creating and building performance. And if we're looking at a new culture of theatre makers where maybe those roles aren't so delineated where you have the director and the designer and the light designer and the sound designer and the stage manager, you've got these small troops and small companies coming together uh, usually under one visionary person who's doing the work or, you know, but we're also seeing collective, uh, people coming up with creativity in a collective way. Um, where and how does one even begin to reincorporate almost the, the beauty of having a specific scenographer or a specific lighting designer with the depth of that kind of input into a creative process? Am I making, uh, is the question making sense? Like, how does one bring that back in where you've got ensemble work and ensemble creativity happening in the theatre making process? And what are your thoughts on, you know, the future of design in this kind of setup? Because that's what seems to be our reality is where everyone is working with bare stages and four cubes instead of thinking of what they could do with it. Uh. You're quite right. The situation today is not uh, <laughs> as good as it looked some years back. Uh, but if, if, when you see the work which Alkasi did in Bombay, it was more or less a one-man show. You know, he did not have separate designers. He did everything. He designed the sets, he designed the lighting, he rehearsed, he choreographed, and uh, his wife Roshan did the costume. <coughs> but he selected the music and he did everything as has been so since independence in this country. You see, the problem today is not to do with set design. It is to do with economics. It is to do, you see, people like us did not mind not earning money. We were supported by our families to do, and we spent very little money, but did very large work. But we were supported by our families and uh, we went to my parents' house every day for breakfast, lunch, no breakfast we had at home. But lunch, and <laughs> lunch and dinner we went and had with uh, my parents. And then in the evening we'd go to the Wellington club and my parents would pay the bill. So, no, this is it's to do with economics. Also to do with theatre spaces. You know, when I look at what's happening in Bombay with so much commercial theatre, how much time do you get on stage? You know, to put up scenography, to put up lighting of consequence, you must have enough time to work and to put things together. Now, Alkasi never had the money to do that, so he went to college halls, he put up a theater in his own uh, building on, uh, on his head, and he worked in many schools, Hill Grange High School, etc. So it is really the definitiveness of purpose. And uh, also, they lived, uh, lived a very frugal, simple life. Nobody had money. So uh, I think it's not to do with the lack of ideas. I think it's to do with the circumstance that young people are in today, where they feel compelled to be independent, because a lot of other things, their lifestyle goes with that independence. So I think it's not about the lack of ideas, it's not about uh, a lack of understanding, but it's circumstantial to the lifestyle today. I just want to follow up with that. Everything you're saying is, it does make sense completely. But somewhere, if you're still, even with those circumstances, everyone is creating and making within a particular set of given circumstances. He did it at the Meghdu Terrace and he also did it at the National School of Drama when he was at the back of Kailash Colony. Uh, and what you still saw was ideas in execution somewhere. And economics aside, all of that aside, I think what I, the question I'm, um, um, what are your thoughts on where can still the idea of, even if I'm going to put one piece of cloth on stage, the fact that I've thought about it, the fact that I've 
thought about its metaphor, its 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 how it you know acts as a metaphor for the inner sense of the characters or the play, etc. I feel like that thinking is is currently lacking in a lot of the work we see, um, and having creators sort of fall back on the circumstances and the economic argument rather than well, you're making something, you're creating something. So, what are your thoughts on how do we bring that kind of thinking back into even the simplest of performative acts, it's the simplest of presentations? Well, uh, there is a history to this in the sense that Arkazi read voraciously, studied voraciously, understood the history of theatre, went deep into it and drew from it. I mean, he drew from everything he read and studied and he taught this to his students, how to create something out of the knowledge that you are acquiring. I really don't know how much time people have to read, to study, to, you know, I mean, academics in theatre is, I mean, sorely lacking in quality. So I think it is the vision of a person that comes up to do what you are talking about. It has to be a person who defines for himself how he wants to work in the theatre. It's not, not ready-made, there's no system, we don't have the infrastructure. But apart from the economics, you know, which is a different reason, there has to be that determination, passion and vision to want you to do something. There is nobody to stop you from doing what you want. The, the idea about technology and how it's affected uh, what we, how anybody would use it, it also has affected how we read theatre or how we read it as audience members who are now completely living in a mediated universe. So the other question is uh, maybe going back to what are the discussions, with respect to audiences and the, the, the set and the, the scenography as performer, as also a part of the whole integrated act, uh, what if I would really be interested to hear what Alkazi's learnings were. We had the review at the beginning just on Macbeth, but especially the bit about Lady Macbeth's costume was phenomenally funny, and I'm going to remember that for a long time. But what, what were his learnings through presenting and putting up these scenes and, and these present, these, these mise-en-scenes uh, in front of different audiences, or even from your own experience? I mean, can you share thoughts about how the audience has interpreted the scenography and the work, the contribution of scenography in different plays that even you've created? Yeah, I'm going to give this to Amal because, you know, a lot of Alkazi's formative thinking happened at the time when he was in England, where new institutions like the ICA, etc., were being created. There were new ideas. People like Herbert Treat were writing on art and. There, it was a whole excitement. You see, what is so common between uh, India and the rest of Europe is the fact that things happen simultaneously. There was a war in Europe in the 40s. We got our independence in the 40s. After the war and after independence, there was a whole new excitement, the idea of building nations, the, build, the idea of creativity was at its very high point. And in this situation, where al goes to England just after the war, uh, I mean, Amar keeps telling me about what influenced him. And I would... Well, I mean, uh, uh, well, you see, the audience response was amazing. I mean, uh, who would not be able to respond to the spectacle of Purana Killa? You know, who would not be able to? And when he created, I mean, I haven't shown you images of King Lear, which he did in the studio theatre, in this little theatre on the third floor of Rabindra Pavan. I haven't shown you pictures of the set designs for the open air theatre, made to in Delhi. Now, I mean, because he was such a master of putting all the elements. And this was the main thrust of his work. He looked at theatre as a 
composite integration of all the arts. And he did so very much in practice. And therefore, you know, all this was quite new for audiences. Audiences were extremely, they were besought with this kind of uh, theatre he was doing. And uh, I mean, we've had, I mean, yeah. You I think that the audiences in Delhi um, uh, were totally uh, taken up with the fact that you could combine all these elements together first to begin with. And it was so meticulously done. Nothing was shabby. Everything was rehearsed to the T. Lighting was rehearsed to the T. We would be rehearsing till late into the night, a thousand times one cue. When the light comes on, when it goes up, when does the actor start to speak? When will the music be down? When will the music be up? And it was orchestrated. Literally, he was orchestrating all the elements of the production like a music composer. And he often sat in the rehearsals with his eyes shut so that it would not be only a visual experience that he was trying to communicate, but an oral experience, the rhythm of the dialogue, together with the music, together with the sound effects. All these things he would listen to separately. And he would say that, you know, if a blind person came to my place, they should also go back with an experience. And at the same time, uh, otherwise he would try to blank this all out, and as if a deaf person, you know, what would a deaf person do? How would the visual then be able to communicate powerfully on its own? So. He had this, and he was a person like, you know, we read about Satyajit Ray. You know, he was sketching, he was listening to music. The whole day, in the morning, he got up in the morning at 5 o'clock and he would start listening to all the music for his plays. That's how we grew up as children, we listened to all this music. You know, and he'd be selecting it and he was very careful because he would uh, do it himself. He would, he would take the pieces and he would put them on to the tape recorder and you'd splice them on. And if anybody who was going to do the music for the play, you know, he sat right near there. And in those days we didn't have digital. So it was fading on, which was manual. <laughs> fading up and fading down and when the actor is talking, the music is below him. It's all very difficult to manipulate. Nowadays it's not in the next queue. We were looking at the numbers. In those pools, you know, the numbers came. So at 0, 0, 002, the music started and then it would fade out. We would gear to this and Al Kazi would be peering over your shoulder <laughs> to see whether you were accurate because he's trying to teach you how to do it accurately. So there was a certain uh, meticulousness about it and this came through to the audience. So when you say you meld all the elements together, it is the composition of those elements and how much, how is the light at that particular moment. The, so it's not that it's a low light or a high light. There are 20 shades of lighting. So I mean, what are you trying to achieve at that moment? So it was blending all these elements together that gave his productions that kind of powerful impact because they were visually very exciting. As Nisar said, they were poetic. They were very poetic in their expression. Uh, they were very quiet moments. They were thunderous moments. There would be, you know, he, 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 and he knew choreography. I think that you cannot use a set with thousands of steps unless you can choreograph on that. First of all, for actors to run down steps is very difficult in long costumes, in any costumes, fall on steps. You know, use steps, fight on steps. There were fight scenes on steps. So, you know, but he's, he's imagining this whole thing because the steps gave him all these levels to be working with and compose on. So, all these things, when you talk to people, they said, we saw Purana Killa and we saw these plays and we saw this and we, they, they cannot forget them because they were strong visual experiences and they were very, very powerful emotive, uh, strong moments in the play where all the action would come to a, uh, to a halt and there would be a dead silence and you know the whole thing would come together and you get kind of goosebumps 
because you know it was very emotional at that particular time. So it was it was that not that he thought that you know okay theater is painting and theater is sculpture and theater is whatever. He actually it was like painting the stage. He was a painter of stages. You know he painted the stage literally and he carved it out. So and as Nisal said, it is a question of his own passion, and it's a question of his own commitment to to not only to his own creativity. I think it is very difficult for people to be creative, but to share everything that they know. Every single thing he knew was shared to an audience of children who were coming from villages. He never felt. For even one second, that those people who are coming, who did, who he had to talk down to them, and he had to explain to them, and he to gaon se aaye hain. Never. He thought that they held in them a greater, much greater life experience than he had, and he said, "I have to learn from them." So you know, this is a person who is a particular person who had a particular aim. And a particular commitment to teach. He was a teacher, basically. Besides being a great director and all that, he was basically an educator, and that was his passion to teach and to communicate it. And that is why we see such a large number of his students who have come up, who have made a mark, who are all the next generation who have succeeded him, who are all there. And uh, you know, some of them work in films more, and some of them work in the theatre more. But it doesn't matter. So it's a it's a it's a very particular person. But I think that what is most important uh, about uh, trying to do this exhibition and and is to communicate that that this this kind of work is possible still. So when a young person like you asks the question, it is extremely relevant. But it is. To to make those small spaces for ourselves, and they don't have to be large. When Nisar says he did Ashar ka ek din, he did not mention that it is for an audience of eighty. Everybody, it's a tiny little courtyard at the back of the thing. It was eighty people. Eighty people sat around and watched the play. It was never for thousands of people. He didn't believe in that. The studio theater, which he broke the wall between two rooms, was for eighty persons. The terrace theatre, main dut, was for eighty persons. Everything that he did was small. It was never gigantic. And even when you sat in the Purana Kila, he could have made seating for hundreds of people, but he didn't. It was about two fifty, three hundred people were watching the play per night. So he much preferred to do many more shows. And allow the actors to get much more experience and exposure on the stage by doing more shows than uh, you know to play to uh, uh, hundreds and thousands and five thousand people, two thousand people, etc. Didn't believe in that kind of thing. I think the greatest thing he understood was the use of space, and what he understood was that space dictates performance. <clears throat> you know, uh, you can change performance by taking, by changing space entirely. And if you look at the history of stage design from the Greeks onwards, this is what you see: that performance space dictates performance structure. And that is why working in small space now. You know, it is so amazing this production of uh, Andayu at the uh, Firosha Kotla, as compared to uh, Purana Kila. As I said, it became an internal experience at Firosha Kotla, and you see, you see the faces of the actors, you see their clothes, which are different. And when you go to the Purana Kila and you see these, you know, huge headdresses and long costumes, I mean. The change of space really creates, necessitates the change in scale of the human form. 